things, and most of us do, but he's saying there's another thing. Uh, natural proportion, which is in all Etruscan things of the unspoiled, unromanized centuries before the Romans came and crushed and ruined the world. There's a simplicity combined with the most peculiar, and here it is, free-breasted naturalness. You see, he's a modern person. He's like many of us. We want natural things. And spontaneity in the shapes and movements of the underworld walls and spaces. Here, he starts criticizing the Greeks. No one ever criticizes the Greeks. The Greeks are perfect. The Greeks are wonderful. The Greeks are the greatest civilization that ever existed, not Lawrence. He's an original <coughs> spirit. The Greeks sought to make an impression in the Gothic, the, the Roman church built upon Greco-Roman ideas, still more seeks to impress big Gothic <coughs> cathedrals in Europe, you go in here, oh, look at this arch, and look at this mighty thing, and you feel puny. You're just a little jerk <laughs> in this overwhelming, you know, oh, cathedral. <laughs> You are sort of like, this is what he wants to tell you. You see, now that's a unique viewpoint, but you never hear that from anybody. You see, uh, still more to impress the mind. The Etruscans No, things they did in their easy centuries are as natural and as easy as breathing. They leave the breast breathing freely and pleasantly with a certain fullness of life. Even the tombs, and that's true, Etruscan quality. Ease, naturalness. We like this, you see. We respond to them. And an abundance of life. No need to force the mind or soul in any direction. He hasn't got the answer to all things. He doesn't pretend to give you a theology. He just says he wants something easy, <coughs> natural, and full of life. But look. Everything that Etruscans gave the tombs have been wiped out. One goes out again in the April sunshine into the sunken road between the soft, greasy, group mounted tombs. As one passes, one glances down the steps of the door of doorway tombs. It's so still and pleasant and cheerful. The place is so soothing. You see, you have to write this right afterwards. You couldn't write this a year or two later. You'd have to write it like the next five days later or something like that. You'd have to write it right off because you have to be fresh in your mind. And uh, that's one of the curious things. One can read about India or Etruria, that's the normal term for Etruscan Etruria, and uh, Benares in India or the Etruscan necropolis. That is the phallic symbol, there it is. The phallic stone. There are small phallic stones, seven or eight inches long, inserted in the rock outside the doors. I told you that. And then there are lingams. Uh, a bee puts the phallic stone back into its sack and just pull them out. <coughs> Big phallic stones probably stood on top of the tumuli and carved very beautifully, sometimes with inscriptions. <laughs> so he tells you all about that. I can't go into all that. Look at page 20. And perhaps in the insistence of these two symbols, what two symbols? I think he's talking about the, the womb, the arcs, as he calls it, in the previous paragraph and the phallus. I told you we're going to get into this stuff here. Uh, in the Etruscan world, we can see the reason for the utter destruction and annihilation of the Etruscan consciousness. The new world wanted to rid itself of these fatal dominant symbols of the old world, the old physical world. So he's explaining to us what happened to this old world, the pre-Greek, pre-Roman, pre-Christian world, the world we know. The Etruscan consciousness was rooted quite blithely in these symbols, the phallus and the arcs. So the whole consciousness, the whole Etruscan pulse and rhythm must be wiped out. Now we see it again under the blue heavens where the larks are singing in the hot April sky. Why the Romans called the Etruscan vicious? He's back to his first sentence, isn't he? Even in their palmy days, you see, you're back to his sarcasm, the Romans were not saints. They thought they ought to be. They hated the phallic and the arcs because they want empire, dominion, power. Read the Apocalypse in the New Testament. Power and so on. And above all, riches, social gain. You cannot dance gaily to the double flute. And at the same time, first flower child. And at the same time, conquer nations or rake in large sums of money. 
to the greedy man, everybody that's in the way of his greed, his vice is gone. Well, those are pretty tough words, as you see, and he's got it all from looking at the Etruscan tombs. I've got to move along here, if I can. You don't mind. You're bored, I'm sure, with the whole thing anyway. Uh, let's go on to page 22. You can read the stuff yourself. The last paragraph there, I think he talks about uh, going to a museum and so on. And when you sit in the post-automobile, what's the post-automobile? That's the bus that takes you back uh, at the end of the day, the post office, the post office. To be rattled down to the station about 4 o'clock in the sunny afternoon, he's, he's got there, you see, he, he did it. You'll probably see the bus surrounded by a dozen buxom, handsome women, I don't know about today, saying goodbye to one of their citizenesses, and in the full, dark, handsome, jovial faces, surely you will see the luster still of the life-loving Etruscans. There's some level Greek eyebrows, but sure there are